I'm representative of those environmental chaps and women and blokes who are standing in the way of progress and interfering with what they consider to be their rights. Well, I've often walked into a bar, you know, <laughs> cockies and say, here's trouble, I say, yeah, you don't know the fucking half of it. <laughs> So tell me about listening to rivers. You say you, you listen to rivers. You've yeah, written it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, they talk and they, they change their intonation and tones and so on. You know, the rattle over the stones or when, when its water's fairly high, you can hear the river rushing the stones along and they clatter a bit then, yeah. you know. And um, I like them clattering and sometimes they hardly, they're almost like a whisper can't help ourselves, can we? We've got to dominate the bloody world around us. Been up along there, and up on some battles and so on, with the Hawkins, but not along this bit. But you'd know every river here, wouldn't you? Oh, across. From an early age, we went off to various parts of Targo and Southland on the weekends to go fishing mainly, but mm. also just to become more familiar with country that we hadn't seen before and that we grew to like and love a great deal. And it instilled in me a desire to protect this wonderful southern part um, <clears throat> for the uh, so that it, there would be something enduring about it all. Enduring insofar as what had evolved within nature itself prior to us and on into the future beyond the likes of me and our offspring and so on. Okay. And I've found over the years that I've become more and more disturbed by the way in which <coughs> progress ends up in what destruction, depletion, degradation, and so on and so on. No respect whatsoever for what's evolved over time in many cases. It's as if it's all about us and that's what counts most. So have you, have you always been a southern man? I ended up in Wellington for a time in my twenties and one day I kept going, well, I, I started to find myself going down to Island Bay and looking across Crook Strait. I could see the seaward Kaikoura and so on. And I came home one day and I said to my partner slash wife, we're going home. She said, I'm not. I said, well, I am. I, I, by then, I, what I'm really talking about, I knew where my home place was and I didn't want to be separated from it. <coughs> and... Um, and I've found that I'm much more at ease in the south than I am in the north, and a major part of that is the sheer numbers. But, and, and I don't believe that we can continue to proliferate in the way in which we are if those who follow us are going to have something that they should treasure left behind. Brian, whenever we make a submission to a hearing's body of some kind, there's always a, a PhD there who's taken one very expensive glimpse at the problem that involves our whole lives. And I've always thought that we should be the expert witnesses. Are you an expert witness? Well, I've got to be, because I'd have to be blind if I wasn't observant and so on. And I've seen tremendous changes in rivers and streams and in the environs of rivers and streams. And I've witnessed you know, a depletion of insect life in the evenings, hatches of flies and so on, and fewer fish in most places, um, not in all places, but in most places. Mm. And, um, and I've seen more and more water being taken from rivers and streams and sprayed onto farms, <coughs> other parts. And I think that, that we've exceeded what we ought to have done. So you use all your writings and your poems to articulate your environmental views. 
Um, yes, I do to some degree, but I've written, I think, a lot of personal poems, poems about relationships and people I'm very fond of and so on. And um, so I've got what some people would call quite a lot of love poems, yeah. matters um, which are about my affection for individuals as well as for places. <coughs> and I've also written a lot of, quite a lot of poems which are <coughs> taking a swipe at the politicos, so on and so on. And so if you went through all of my stuff, you would see my growing concern um, for what we're doing to this wonderful place. We're surrounded by farmers here and you know, I can tell you that many of them would like to see me dangling from a pivot irrigator, but how do, you, how do you get on with your neighbours and with developers and with farmers? How do they treat you? I'm representative of those environmental chaps and women and blokes who are standing in the way of progress and interfering with what they consider to be their rights. What right does one man have? overtaking the commons from another? Mm. That's a good question for a philosophy paper. I see us as, I'd like to think that we accepted that we were um, part and parcel of the world around us, but not entitled to dominate and and do things with and to it. The result, as I've said, in degradation and ruination and so on and so on. Would your father's generation have done the same thing today if they'd had the tools? Uh, <clears throat> I don't know because he never discussed that with the father. Mm. Um, he took us to places that he and my mother and brothers greatly liked and I know he hoped that it would be there for those who follow. Well, there's one moment that started us all when you and the painter Graham Sidney from over the hill teamed up with Anton Oliver, the next All Black Captain, to fight a wind farm on the Lamalor Range. That, that must have been a great association. Anton liked the outdoors and became introduced to more of the outdoors through Graham and myself. Mm -hmm and we became close friends. And um, Anton used to act as a, um, some sort of a uh, spokesman on environmental matters amongst the <laughs> rugby players. <laughs> yeah. That reminds me of Greg McGee, I think, you know, yeah. when Greg, Greg McGee wrote Forskins Were Meant. And yeah. They took it because he'd been a player and it was easier to accept his ideas that maybe mm. something was going wrong within that structure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, um, and Anton's bloody clever chap too. He had a good sense of humour. Mm. Um, if I was with him I always felt physically safe. <laughs> he could break me with one little snap. <laughs> yeah, but well, see then I did rugby books too. I Before that I'd done um, I got asked to do Colin Mead's story, uh -huh. and um, Colin was said, "All right, well, to the publishers, I presume you know whether he can do it or not. Leave it to that." And Colin was asked a question a year or so later about me and how he found me. He said, "Oh, well, he's different." <laughs> <laughs> Is that called luck on it? Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah, but you know. Um, I mean, I liked him immediately because there was no fluff about him. Mm. And so on. And he listened, he asked him a question, he gave me date and direct answers, mm. and so on and so on. He told me some funny stories, he had a droll sense of humour, and so on. And um, again, he was one I'd have been more than happy to go down dark alleys with because if yeah. you want to take Colin on, it would be a big mistake. In any environmental battle, we always um, weigh heavy with our losses. Uh, and I wonder how you keep on going. How is it you keep on fighting and fighting? Do, do you ever get to the point where you think it's all a waste of time? Um, 
I try not to dwell on the past and what one's failed in. You just got to deal with the now. Mm -hmm. And uh, but you know, Manipuri was was a win for us going back there. We beat off the giant wind farm proposal. Um, we don't have a dam on the Nevis River you know, as a consequence of the activist, so-called activist activities. You know, they wanted to put, did I say that before, the aluminium smelter at the entrance to Otago Harbour. Really? Yeah. When, and that was, you know, a few hundred metres away from the albatross colony on the Tairoa Head. And, um, you know, that was a fierce fight in Dunedin. And, and it was, you know, it all was being sold to us as progress and the city will go ahead and so on and so on. When people talk about going ahead, they don't actually cost in the environmental effects. You know, Wendell Berry, the American writer, and her, that said, well, we've got to see the world around us as a community to which we belong, rather than everything as a commodity. And, you know, it's succinct and to the point. Um, so in all your experience of these, of the South, do you have a favourite river? Mm, well, I, you, I used to like the Ahariri River and the Ohau before they put canals and, and the rest of it and completely buggered up half of them up there in the Mackenzie country um, because it was a wild, boisterous uh, river, the Ohau, strong and powerful and the hatches of flies in the evenings and these big brown and rainbow trout slashing at them and so woof 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 and wow if you could get a fish one of them on off it went downstream and you'd have to run <laughs> over the bowlers after it so on and so on and the Mackenzie country has been as I said completely transformed now so it's just full of pivot irrigators and and so on, and pylons, and it's an artificial place to what it used to be. But I could see across it and look at to Mount Cook, and in those days when I was a youngster, I said, I'm going to climb that mountain one day. And yeah. Phil Temple and I did. You did. And boy, there's a boost standing on the top of Mount Cook. When you do that, when you stand on a mountain, do all the troubles and problems of the world diminish? They, no, they don't diminish, but one's aware of what one can achieve. One tries hard enough. We were attending a climate change march in Cathedral Square, the day of the mosque shootings, and uh, Kathleen Gallagher, you know the, the film she's made about rivers and so forth, um, she put a copy of your poem, Sky, on the cairn that we'd built in Cathedral Square. And that poem wasn't simply, in the end, a reference to what we're losing with the environment. It, in the end, became a reference to many other things we're losing, because that was the day of the mosque shootings. If the sky knew half of what we're doing down here, it would be stricken inconsolable, and we would have nothing but rain. And here's four short, four lines. It's called Deserts, for instance. The loveliest places of all are those that look as if there's nothing there to those still learning to look. Do you find environmentalism a lonely fight? I think it is to a considerable degree because one feels as if one is fighting against the dominant powers and influences. But then I, then I quote Cyril Walter, who ran co-op bookshop in Christchurch for years and coached us in hockey. And sometimes he'd say, you know, with some people, it's not their ignorance that astounds, it's the fucking extent of it. <laughs> <laughs> One day, when you are beside me, invite me to speak of the secrets I never knew I wanted to tell you, of the warmth I never knew I owned until you released it by moving close as lamplight seems to glass. 
Ask me why I came to you with the reverence of one who sees a flower bloom where none has bloomed before. By saying what is, I will have said what was. Sometimes, when you're content, ask me what it is that moves me to want to hold you so, so often, and laugh when I tell you the same old indestructible thing. One day, when you are where you need no invitation to be, I will tell you how you flower like lamplight in me.